remarkable debut novel, Disappearing Earth, was a finalist for the National Book Award in Fiction. It was also nominated for the first book prize from the National Book Critics Circle Award. It was one of the New York Times top 10 best books of the year, and it was at the top of the best book list from publications and bookstores and libraries across the country. And I have to say that it was also one of my favorite books of the year. So Julia, welcome. Thanks so much for joining us in St. Louis. Thank you much for having for having me, having me virtually, <laughs> having yeah. me by Zoom. It's so wonderful to meet you and talk to you about this, Terry. Okay, well, I'm so sorry we couldn't host you at the library, but this is the next best thing and I'm glad we can still connect you with our readers. Um, so to get started about Disappearing Earth, um, your novel is really a book about an area that I have never encountered in literature before um, in a really amazing place too. Can you tell us a little bit just to start, give us a sense of the setting in this place in, the, in Russia and why you wanted to write about it? Absolutely, yeah. So my novel is a, um, a missing person story in some ways. It's about two young girls that disappear from a very remote community in Russia. And that remote community is very, very, very remote. It's the Kamchatka Peninsula, which is a peninsula that hangs off of the edge of uh, the Pacific coast of Russia into the Bering Strait. So if you kind of picture the tail of Alaska swinging out, it swings into Kamchatka. And Kamchatka is isolated um, by its distance from the capital, from Moscow. It's a nine hour flight from Moscow. It's isolated by geography. It's, it's a volcanic peninsula that's surrounded by mountains and volcanoes that keep it from having any roads or train tracks connecting it to the mainland. And for most of the 20th century, it was blocked off to visitors entirely and even blocked off to most Russians because it was a strategic military base for the Soviet Navy. Um, so it's only opened up to outsiders in the past 30 years. And it still stays very closed in many ways because of its geography, because of its sort of like forbidding landscape. And it is a extraordinarily beautiful and interesting and compelling. Um, and I kind of fell in love with it and wanted to write this novel there and nowhere else. And you lived there for a year too, right? Yeah, I spent about a year and a half there. So I was there from 2011 to 2012 to start researching this book. And then I went back in 2015 to uh, work on the draft once I had it. Yeah. Well, I was amazed by the really evocative descriptions of place throughout the book. I mean, you get this sort of real sense of the isolation um, of this peninsula, um, the relationship kind of between the land and the sea, these volcanoes and this volcanic research center that's a big part of it. Um, so does that writing, that descriptive writing of place, does that come naturally to you as a writer? Or is that something you've kind of trained yourself to do? I think that's a really great question. And I, I think it's hard for me to perceive um, my own writing sometimes, like very fairly from the outside. But I think that when I was working on this book, I, a lot of working through it and, and drafting it was digging into my own um, love for and kind of unhealthy obsession with this particular place that had been so beautiful and life-changing for me. And so I wanted to spend a lot of time talking about the place. I wanted to spend a lot of time in descriptions and I wanted to spend a lot of time um, recording what particular qualities of Kamchatka were so compelling to me. And I wonder if that um, same quality of writing about place would come out, you know, if I'm writing about New Jersey where I grew up or, or New York where I live now, I, I'm not sure it would, um, but I hope it would, I'll keep practicing. Yeah. Um, so the book opens with one character telling a story of an earthquake and a tsunami um, on this peninsula that wiped out, took a whole um, village out to sea, just erased a whole village. Um, and I think that's kind of one of the anchors for the title, Disappearing Earth, um, although there's lots of disappearances that take place throughout the book. So is that story true? Is that legend or is that a true story? It is a true story that is made into the legend by the character that's telling it. So the character that tells that story is an 11 year old and she's telling it to her eight year old sister. So in her telling, this tsunami is just, you know, it's 150 feet tall and it, it, it is so destructive to this one village and washes this village out to sea, like you said, but no one else even notices, you know, it's this very um, exaggerated version of a real thing that happened. 
which is, I believe in 1952, there was a tsunami, um, a 9.0 earthquake right off the coast of Kamchatka that, that created the tsunami that hit Petropolis, which is the capital city there, where the girls who are telling the story live in, in our, you know, in today's age. Um, and did an extraordinary amount of damage. And some of the details that she says in her telling of the tsunami story, like people felt it in Hawaii, people felt it in Australia. Those are true, you know, those are details that in my imagination she heard as truth and um, is making sure to include, because those are true things. The novel's literary fiction, but there's also a mystery in it. And there's a, a crime that takes place in like the first 10 pages. Um, we have this kidnapping that takes place. Do you want to talk a little bit about that central crime and then yeah. how you sort of built this mystery around it? Yeah, absolutely. So those two girls, the one that tells the, their sisters, the one that tells the tsunami story to the other, they, we open the book, we meet these girls, one tells this scary story to the other. And then very quickly, like you said, that's that fear and that sense of uncertainty becomes real for them. They um, are on the beach hanging out kind of, you know, telling scary stories and having fun. And they end up uh, meeting someone who sprained his ankle on the beach. And so they help him to his car and then thanks, he offers them a ride home and they accept and he ends up not taking them home. He keeps on driving with them. And that's where our first chapter ends. And every chapter after that moves a month forward from that disappearance and introduces us to a different woman or girl in their community. And so we kind of um, cast quite a wide net over a year in the investigation of their disappearance and try to figure out what happened to them and why it happened to them and how we can recover them if possible. So the, the structure is very complex, the way each of these characters um, are a unique perspective, but then the story all kind of comes together towards the end and you see how, um, how the crimes resolved and then also how each of these people have sort of been impacted by it or played a role um, in it. Did you did you have that figured out as you were writing, or did you have one of those like I was picturing one of those um, you know crime solving boards with the red thread connecting everybody? That's like those conspiracy theorists, or I. <laughs> that's exactly what I had. <laughs> um, it was really important to me to have as many characters as possible. Um, that I wanted to not just focus on like a victim, a perpetrator, and a detective. To me, that is a kind of um, investigation that we see a lot. And that often is not very reflective of how um, violence occurs or is addressed. It's, it's not just a few people acting decisively and brilliantly. It is um, a lot of people, a whole community of people who are acting together to make it possible for us to hurt each other or who are acting together to help each other. Um, and that that is actually how crime is solved. That's sort of like by fits and starts and little, you know, offshoots onto wrong paths and then coming back perhaps. And there are so many different ways that uh, a mystery like this develops. And so I wanted there to be this very wide net cast over the book where we meet all sorts of different people who are connected in all sorts of different ways. Definitely the connections between the characters was the hardest thing and the most exciting thing in the writing and the revision. And I had all sorts of boards with strings and post-it notes and little thumbtacks um, trying to sort it all out for myself. So I, I certainly don't want to give away the ending, but did you always know that that's how the book would end as you were writing it? like so that you would get to that resolution? I yeah. <laughs> had a very specific idea and from the start about how, um, how, how we would end. I had, I, I had previously worked on a manuscript for a long time that didn't have um, kind of like a strong concept or structure going into it. And I thought, oh, as I work on it, I'm gonna figure it out. And I didn't, and so, so with this manuscript, I really wanted to have made a lot of kind of structural decisions from the start. So I made a structural decision about the ending that felt very right to me. Um, and I will say it was not this ending. That it, as I kept working on the manuscript and as I was getting farther and farther into the first draft, I felt like I hadn't found my right ending yet. 
but I didn't know what else it would be. And I felt I really wanted to adhere to that certainty that I'd had in the start. And then all of a sudden I realized, oh my gosh, this is what the ending is going to be. And I, I remember it so well. It was one of those very rare and magical moments where it like came to me. I, I remember being at my grandmother's house and I was like in bed, I think already and sitting up and thinking, oh my gosh, this is what the ending is going to be. Um, so that certain ending transferred to this other certainty. And then that's what it, that second choice, that second knowledge is what it stayed with the entire time. And it never changed after that. And I'm, I'm glad about that because it felt, much more right to me in terms of what I wanted to do with the book and the kinds of stories I want to tell. Okay. Well, as a reader, it certainly felt right to me too. I mean, the way everything sort of comes together in the end and all these characters' lives play out um, towards this ending. I mean, it, it felt very natural. It's sort of like a, a deck of cards that gets shuffled and you end up with a what, what's a good poker hand, a straight flush or something. You know? I, don't, I believe, I don't play poker. So whatever you say, I believe. <laughs> But I've, um, I have lots of, the ending is probably the thing I have the most conversations with folks about. I, everyone has really different feelings on it, and it's fascinating to me because because um, I feel so strongly about it in such a particular way. But I don't necessarily bring more authority as a reader in any way to the book. Like everyone's coming to it with their own reading and interpretation, and some folks react all sorts of ways. Good. Um, so the book also deals with the relationship between the ethnic Russian community in this area and the indigenous population, the indigenous people. Um, so, which I found really interesting. I didn't know about these people. Um, can you just give a little bit of background of who the indigenous people are of this area? Yeah, absolutely. So Kamchatka is like, you know, much of Russia. Russia is the biggest country in the world. And um, has been colonized and settled over hundreds of years by um, ethnic Russians, by, by like kind of Eurasian Slavs. So folks that are coming out of Eurasia and moving over of this continent over um, a millennium. And by the time they got, by the time ethnic Russians got to Kamchatka, it was kind of like 1600s, 1700s. Um, and they came in and started colonizing and came into um, Petropavlos, which is the main city, the capital city there. Now, you know, it was, it was sort of established as the seat of colonization around this bay where these boats, um, kind of European boats came in. But there had been people living on Kamchatka for um, over 10,000 years, uh, folks who had been living there for a very, very long time who were indigenous Kamchatkan, are indigenous Kamchatkan. And there are also people who are indigenous to other parts of Siberia and Russia, who also like these ethnic Russians, like moved um, eastward and settled into this beautiful place. So there are characters in my book who are Koryak, who are um, indigenous Kamchatkan. There are characters in my book who are Aven, which is a group of people that's indigenous Siberian who came to Kamchatka in about the 1800s. Um, and there are characters in the book who are ethnic Russian whose you know, families may have been there for a couple hundred years or maybe even a couple decades because they were posted to Kamchatka from elsewhere in the Soviet Union during the 20th century or came more recently. Um, and I, it was important to me to write, to try to write about Kamchatka as folks there live um, in, a, in a diverse and multi-ethnic and um, tense and colonized place. And not, because I think so much of the image of Russia we get is one that is particularly ethnic Russian, one that, um, you know, folks are Eurasian and look like that, that Russia is so big and there are so many people that live there and not everyone looks the same way. Or so, comes from and, the same history. And I, one part that I thought was very interesting, compelling throughout the book is there's actually a third missing girl, too. Um, I don't think there's, that's not giving too much away to say that. Um, but of course, she's from the indigenous um, community and her disappearance is treated much differently by the police and the community. Um, uh, so without spoilers, can you talk about her role in the book? Yeah, I think, so I, I'll, I'm going to talk about her role in the book, but I will say what um, motivates me to write and read in 
a particular way. I think I grew up reading and consuming a lot of missing girl stories uh, in the U.S. You know, as, as someone born and raised in the U.S. Um, and you know, I love Law and Order Special Victims Unit. I love when I was little reading fairy tales about women in peril. I loved um, uh, true crime podcasts, like sort of gobbled up. And after a while of consuming the same story in some way over and over again, it it really makes one wonder, what, what is my appetite for this? And what is this giving me? What itch is this scratching? Why, why is this compelling to me? Um, and it began to feel more and more clear to me as a young white American woman that a lot of the stories I was consuming were about um, young white women in peril um, with absolutely no acknowledgement of the kind of systemic violence that creates this and puts the spotlight and all these resources and all this attention on young white women in peril and girls in peril and um, ignores and facilitates violence toward um, young women of color in the US or young indigenous women or not young women, you know, all sorts of, all sorts of people who are being hurt and whose pain is the foundation used as a foundation for um, like this acceptance of what ought to be normal or what is routine or like, well, that's totally acceptable, but if a beauty queen goes missing then and, and she has blonde hair, then it's a big problem. Um, that is a dynamic that is um, certainly very, very present in the US uh, and present in a lot of other places too. And that I think to me in this moment has more to say looking at that systemically than looking at the individual um, white, white girl victim. Uh, and, and so it was really interesting to me in writing this book to try to create a fictional world in which what is most and that that reflects that the media and the authorities and the politicians and the police really are very engaged in and interested in these young white girls these, these ethnic russian girls who disappear in the first chapter and that that disappearance um is inextricably linked with and made possible by um, an earlier disappearance that was treated completely differently, is completed treat, treated completely differently, um, and that matters, like viscerally matters. I, it, it is important to me to try to understand why, um, we continue to hurt people and why some people we tell ourselves are okay to hurt. Um, that, that is a big task for me as a, as a person, I think, and a big task for all of us to try to understand. Yeah. Well, I certainly appreciated that. I'm a big reader of um, suspense fiction and crime fiction and true I love, crime. I love true crime as well. Love it. Um, and I think that that's a big change. There's a big change in our art on um, crime and violence against people that we are becoming more aware um, of how marginalized communities are treated. Um, and I think that, you know, as our art reflects it, then our community will become more empathetic and aware of it too. So, so one thing that I was um, impressed with throughout is that it, I think the book really falls into the sort of tradition of the sort of story cycle. Um, so you have all these different voices and perspectives that come together in the end um, for this bigger picture of a community and a moment in time. Um, you know, I thought it was very similar to like the work of Louise Erdrich. Um, some other great novel. Were you writing in that tradition specifically? She's my favorite. She's one of my favorite writers in the whole world. I can't tell you how happy that makes me. Oh, uh, me too. I love her. I love but I her. really, I thought of it throughout. This oh. is 
with the indigenous community and the different voices. Um, so obviously she was an influence. Did you have other influences? That I'm like totally bowled over. I'm so <laughs> glad that we both love her so much. <laughs> um, I thought a lot about Alice Monroe when I was working on this. Um, not in terms of the linking of the stories, but in terms of um, reading Alice Monroe really blew my mind uh, and changed everything for me. It was revelatory in so many ways. And, and one of them, the biggest one was seeing how much honor, honor and dignity she gives to the smallest moments of our lives. Um, these little things that maybe to an outside observer wouldn't seem to matter or that they would minimize, but to the person who's experiencing it, 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 it changes their whole life what they're going through and it matters forever. Um, and when I was thinking about creating these many stories and these many characters who are all linked to each other and who are all linked to this missing person case or these missing person cases, but also have their own daily um, kind of preoccupations and concerns, I really wanted to sit with that, those daily concerns and um, make them feel alive for myself as I wrote them because uh, they were so important to me to read about in other people's work. Um, yeah, I, there's so many wonderful writers who do things that just bowl me over and I feel like I'm always chasing after in the work. Um, well, do you wanna tell us about your own beginnings as a writer? Did you always wanna be a writer? How did you first get started? I did always want to be a writer. <laughs> this is a, I always wanted to be a writer. I remember um, at my public library in New Jersey when I was growing up, and I think I found a, a clipping of it in the local paper of this class of us um, who took like a write your own book course. And I remember how intensely and excited I was about being able to write and illustrate our own books. Um, and I wrote a book about, uh, a dead body found in a snowman. So it really like was, it was, it wasn't very far off from where I wound up um, writing about this mystery in Russia. But I, I always wanted to be a writer and I'm incredibly grateful for my whole life that I had um, teachers, especially when I was really young, like a, a second, my second grade teacher who, um, made me feel like that was a possible thing who was super encouraging i would write these long stories about orphans and wolves in a notebook and i'd bring it in and it was i'm sure like incomprehensible and all spelled wrong and and she always made me feel like it was the most wonderful and exciting thing in the world and i think that um having that support really young made a huge difference in that i still i feel like it was the more it remains the most exciting and wonderful thing in the world. Um, yeah, and it, it made it feel like wanting to be a writer was not a pipe dream. Are you working on anything new? Can you tell us what's up next for you? Yeah, so I'm working on a second book that it's a second novel that explores very similar themes, stuff about power and gender and community. Um, but it's set a lot closer to home for me, which is great because it means I don't have to uh, you know, save up for three years to go research it. I can research it a little easier than I could Kamchatka. Um, but right now in the immediate future, I am working on, I'm in my third trimester of pregnancy. So I'm working oh. on a, yeah, so I'm working on a, a much more sort of imminent project than book two that um, but hopefully I'll be able to juggle them both capably. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> a big adventure. I didn't. I didn't quite. Um, I was naive about how much energy this this process would take. It takes a lot of energy. Yeah, it does. <laughs> um, so, will your subsequent books? Do you think you'll stay in this sort of kind of mesh between literary fiction and mystery? I I wonder. I think for me right now in my reading. Um, something that I've learned in the past few years, probably 
five or 10 years has been that I love to read a book and that sets out a question and then answers it at the end. I love to read a book in which something happens and I want to know what has happened and, and understand that. And it pushes me forward. Um, I like to read a book where like things ha are happening in the world and um, that are propelling the characters uh, forward in their lives. And to me, often that is, is a, that, that the sense of a question or that sense of pace comes from a mystery, um, that there's something that is amiss and then we have to figure it out. That is very exciting to me to read and I love to read it. Um, and I love to try to write it. So I, for right now, that's the, that's the carrot I'm chasing and it has been for, um, some years now and and it's hard for me to picture what comes next but i imagine that if and when my reading tastes change and i'm drawn towards something else then i'll try to write um something else but for now i love i love this what are you reading and do you have any um recommendations for great quarantine reads to help get us through this i am reading right now radium girls i just started last night like stayed up so one in the morning reading it, can't get enough. Fascinating. Um, which is this nonfiction about these young women who were ingesting, like in the kind of teens into the 20s that were ingesting these little amounts of radium. They were painting clock dials. And then, not, not great, it turns out. We learned through their experience um, to ingest bits of radium consistently and be encouraged by your employer to do so over and over and over again. Um, it's very fascinating. It's very, very fascinating. Well, Julia, thank you so, so much for joining us. This was absolutely wonderful. It was great to um, get to meet you in person virtually. <laughs> yes. I think that we can um, you know, have you back at the library in person for your next book. But again, I wanted to mention that books are available for purchase through our wonderful friends at Left Bank Books. You can mm -hmm. go to leftbankbooks.com and order the books. They can ship them to you and get them very efficiently out. Um, I want to say many special thanks to the crew at HEC Media who are carrying us through this new world of virtual author events. Um, and yeah, thanks to everybody who is watching. Please join us again. And um, Julia, good luck with the baby and Thank everything. You. Thank right you. Right, take Thanks. care. I appreciate it. Thanks, Carrie. Stay safe.